Bonjour, dear friends. Comment allez-vous? Isn't it a beautiful setting? Look, I have a magical glass of wine tonight. And I'm so thrilled to welcome you for another JCB Live. But we need a little more music, Jen, don't you think? <laughs> no, I'm joking. So, dear friends, this is a very exciting, phenomenal, historical evening again on the JCB Live. Tonight, we're going to be welcoming a very iconic, extraordinary personality that helped shape the wine world in California. Not just in Napa Valley, not just in the Russian River, but in Napa Valley at large. He and his wife, the fabulous Carla, have founded an incredible winery now 20 years ago, hard to imagine, named the Ramey Wine Cellars. He is, of course, today, shouldered with his beautiful, irresistible ladies, Ellen and Claire, who've been learning everything about wine, vineyard, and obviously the essence of the terroir. His name is the fantastic David Ramey. And before he comes up, I want all of you to know that he's the father of many incredible vineyard and winemaking techniques. From, of course, you know, using what in America many years ago was not even widespread, endogenous yeast. One of the things that is today so common, David has been at the origin of it. In addition to all his credits, he was one of the men who started Chalk Hill Vineyards, one of the men who worked at Simi Winery, and of course, the fantastic Dominus Estate right here in Napa Valley, and our very good friend, the Rudd family, with today a great estate, you know, managed by Samantha. So David Ramey is a very iconic, charming, sexy, debonair man. Let's make sure we ask him about his Red Sox because he typically wears them, even when he wears a short. So we'll see today. And we're going to be doing a very unique comparative tasting between Chardonnays and some great wines that he's produced from the Russian River, as well as, of course, the Buena Vista that he's helped us make. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the time to unveil the master of all the king of Sonoma and Napa, Mr. David Ramey. Hey, there I am. <laughs> Bonjour, you know, David. Bonjour, Jean-Charles. I have to say thank you so much for your very fulsome sound. introduction, but all those personality <laughs> traits, I think you were projecting a little. They, they apply more to you than to me. But uh, anyway, thank you. David, we need the sound. <laughs> ah. I want to hear your beautiful voice. Good. Oh, that's better. Can you put it back? Okay. Wait a minute. Um, okay. Can you hear me now? I can. All right. All right. Well, you're beautiful. This, you know. Our, our audience will have, will, will have missed the, 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 all the jokes in, in my intro, but that's fine. Well, let's start again your intro. Go ahead. <laughs> well, no, I wanted to, I'm sorry. Well, I wanted to, I wanted to say that, you know, thank you very much for your very kind and fulsome uh, introduction, Jean-Charles. But I, I have to say, I think you were projecting a little bit there because your uh, character descriptions of me apply more to you than, than to me. But in, in any case, thanks very much. No, no, it doesn't. And you know why, dear friends, all of you listening, David was trained, of course, as well in Bordeaux. And I would love, David, give all our friends, as we pour, of course, the first wine, we're going to have to try the wonderful David Ramey wines. Give everybody just a, a quick idea of your background in the world of wine, because this is an amazing history. And I want to oh. Listeners to know, you know, the, the foundation of America is in front of them. Oh, that's not true. Um, 
But I think you've covered most of it. You know, I, I do have a, a, a Master of Science in Enology from, from UC Davis in 79. And then I worked I worked in Bordeaux at the établissement Jean-Pierre Moex. Christian Moex was kind enough to invite me over. And then I worked at a factory in Australia just for that experience. And then I had the good fortune to uh, become assistant winemaker to uh, Zelma Long at CIMI for five years. We yeah. did some really good work together. And I learned a lot from from Zelma, which was essentially really from the Mandavi method. I mean, a lot of the experiment, you know, urge to experiment and continuous improvement was was really sort of not only Zelma, but the the, the years she spent at, at Mandavi. So then I, then I replaced Mary Edwards at, at uh, Matanzas Creek for five years. That's right. And then, and then Christone asked me back to uh, Bordeaux in 89, my then fiance, now wife of 30 years and uh, business partner, Carla, uh, and I were married over there. Christian Moex hosted our wedding very graciously. Um, came back and took the job at Chalk Hill. For, so for six years, kind of, kind of uh, elevated Chalk Hill a little bit. Then over to Dominus, I was in charge of getting the, the Herzog and Numeral building um, constructed. And, um, and, but after a couple of years, I got approached by Leslie Rudd and he convinced me to leave and help him turn the Girard Winery into Rudd Estate. So that was my last job. Now the significance of, of those last two is that um, I said to Christian when he was trying to get me to leave Chalk Hill, I said to Christian, you don't, you don't make any white wine. And he said, well, if you want to make a little Chardonnay on the side, that's okay. <laughs> and a light bulb went off. It's like, yeah, I can do that. I know how to do that. So <clears throat> I knew Larry Hyde from uh, Matanzas Creek. I bought his Semillon to go in and, and to the Matanzas Sauvignon Blanc. And, and he found me a little Chardonnay. So we actually started not 20 years ago, but 24 years ago with the 1996 vintage. Um, and um, so I was able to grow the brand, start the brand while I was at Dominus and and then and then transition it to Rudd and grow it there. And we've been independent since um, 2002, so 18 years independent. What a background, which is amazing. You know, David, and I've always admired in you is your ability to not only know France so well, California so magically well, and be able to be Sonoma and Napa at the same time, because often a winery or a style could be labeled to one or the other, but you really happen to be both. Well, thanks. Yeah, th th and you mentioned two aspects of that. A, a little odd story, story I suppose. But when we got out of Davis in '79, and and I know some some people may know that the, the class of retreads, liberal arts majors that ended up at Davis in in the in the late '70s was was pretty large. I mean, my friends John Kunzgard. Um, Lee Hudson, uh, Doug Nall, uh, David Graves and Dick Ward of Saintsbury, Randall Graham, um, uh, Doug Schaefer was there. He was an undergrad, actually. Park Hafner, an undergrad. Um, Heidi, Heidi Peterson Barrett was in the class behind us. And um, at the time, I was the only one that wanted to go to France to work. Everybody else said, at least at least some couple people I can remember, said, well, why, you know, you can't compare France and California, you know, it's apples and oranges. And my first response was, well, every wine buyer in Manhattan is comparing France and California every day of the week. That's um, it. <laughs> and and um, I, also, I also thought, you know, that, well, if I were an architect and I wanted to build something like the Taj Mahal, the thing that I would do would be to go to Taj Mahal with my protractors and, and, and rulers and measurements and, and, and scope it out. And I just thought, you know, in Burgundy, in Bordeaux anyway, Bur Burgundy for sure, you would know this, you can correct me. Um, they've been making wine for a thousand years, uh, 2000 maybe, I don't know, since the Romans. And um, why don't they, they've almost by accident probably have perfected methods that that work in making Chardonnay and Cabernet. And why don't we go, why don't I go and find out what those methods are? And it turns out that sort of informed my, the development of my career in, in California and the way I've, I've made wine. And it, it turns out in my opinion anyway, that those thousands of year old techniques developed with these varieties in France work the same way with our varieties here in California when they're grown, the same varieties grown here. Well, so on that note, David, we have an amazing line. 
and I don't want to sip alone. We need to have a cheer now. I'm having this, as you know, incredible wine that I've loved always. So dear friends, many of you have this wine as well. This is the famous Remy Fort Ross Sea View, Sonoma Coast Vintage 2017. So David, talking about techniques, talking about applying Burgundian vision into California, you've been, as a Burgundian, I could say that, I vouch for it, the master at it. So do you want to describe a little bit this one in a few words? And well, then I, I have another question following that, of course. I don't know about a few, but I would say that, that just some background, this is, this is all from the Martinelli Charles Ranch out on Bohem Dillon Road. So this is yep. what people call the true Sonoma Coast. It's an old vineyard. It's called the Charles Ranch because Lee Martinelli Sr.'s wife, Carolyn, um, her father, uh, Mr. Charles, planted it. It was planted, I think, in 1982. Um, and it's on those beautiful, it's on the ridge in from uh, the first ridge. It's right uh, parallel to flowers, uh, but on the second ridge in. And yep. uh, we, we get most of the fruit. So it's, it's all barrel fermented, but not a lot of new oak, only about 15% new oak. 12 That's months, what I love. 12 months That's on the leaves in, in barrel. Um, and then it's bottled unfiltered. So all our wines are unfiltered. We don't own a, a filter and it's, and it's fully malolactic. Malolactic gets amongst the ABC crowd, anything but Chardonnay crowd, as, which has died down a little bit, but 10 years ago was pretty active. You know, Chardonnay got the, uh, uh, a bad name and, and, and malactic got a bad name and people thought that it was an activist, you know, an insidious plot by activist California winemakers to make buttery Chardonnay. And while that's possible, it doesn't have to turn out that way, witness this wine. That's and right. I would just I would just say too that all wine goes through malactic naturally, red or white, um, unless you intervene and block it. So we let the natural bacteria carry the malolactic through. It happens in January, February, March at the latest. And, and, and you get a, by doing that on the yeast leaves, it, it integrates the buttery character so that you get the, just the, a little nuance of complexity, but, and also some textural richness, but not, it doesn't, it. doesn't need to stand out. And, and I hope everybody stays staying with us. And if not, you can get this wine, of course, through the Oakville Wine Merchant and through David Ramey. David, I'd love for you to touch on, we have many, many questions, obviously, and question coming in from many listeners. I want to hear a little bit about all your great innovation. We talked about endogenous yeast, surly aging. We talked about malolactic fermentation. You've been really a catalyst of, you know, phenomenal natural wines in many ways you just described, and all those techniques in California when no one was really there. Can you just name a few and, and what has changed the landscape here, thanks to you. Well, I, I do want to um, I do want to tip a hat to Paul Draper of Ridge Vineyard, who has been using native yeast for for decades. So yeah. really, he was the first. Uh, is almost all red grapes, but uh, I started from the second time I worked in France, eighty nine. I started working with native yeast. I came back thinking. Why have they been using native yeast all these years in France and the old world, and 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 we don't? And I and so I gave it a, a try. And and um, there's a few tricks that you need to know, but we've been 100% native for for decades now, and have no stuck ferments, no volatile acidity, no sulfides, not, nothing. I mean, there's just a couple of tricks you need to know. But to your other question, Jean Charles, uh, really the the most significant. I, there's two things I'm going to say, but the, the most significant was whole cluster pressing. Yeah. Because when, when I started at, at CME, everybody, uh, well, the first grapes I shoveled were at uh, Lambert Bridge Winery in 1978, but everybody was doing overnight skin contact for Chardonnay. And, and, and there was no temperature control and there were no night harvest either. So the grapes were all harvested in the daytime. They'd come in in the afternoon hot and we'd crush them and add sulfur and put them in this tank. And then and then let them sit overnight. And most of the tannins in, in uh, people don't think of, of white wine as having tannin, but all the color comes from tannin. Um, That's and right. it, those, are, those are in the skins. And so if, if you do skin contact, maceration pelliculaire, 
um, you, you extract all the tannins. And in the old days, they thought, old days like in the 80s, some people thought, oh, these wines are going to live forever because tannin is antioxidative. But that's red wine logic where you have some anthocyanin, some color to polymerize and absorb the oxygen. With white wine, if the tannins are there, they're just going to turn brown and, and taste That's nasty. Yeah. And this is what happened three years later. So I published a paper on it in the ASCV journal. And, and then at, at Mat and then I, when I went to Matanzas, I eliminated, I went direct to press the Burgundian method at the time. So 1985, you remember they had the little demoisie, yeah. these demers right there, but the, 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 the cage was out. So the grapes would go in and just be, crushed and then pumped into the axial feed of the press, of, the, of yep. the new kind of press. That was the way. So that's what I did at Matanzas. And then I thought, well, I still am pumping, I'm grinding. What if I eliminate that? So we constructed a, a plywood hopper on top of the press at Matanzas <laughs> Creek. So you created about, a new hopper. <laughs> about, about 1987. And then, and then people started copying that. And, um, you know, and then, then with, uh, with, with stainless steel hoppers and, so now most people say they do whole cluster pressing. I'm not sure they could tell you the origins or why they do it. But the reason is to 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 not have so much tannin in the wine, to have a, a, a silkier, more delicate palate, as well as better shelf life. So David, you know, less technical on the wine now as a question. You've constantly in your life, and a lot of people love our spiritual approach in those discussions as far as what drives you, you think, as a person to always push it outside of the norm or outside of the basic formula that helps you to make something. You're always outside of the circle, and that's what I love with you. And we've been, obviously, collaborating on wine. The next one, we'll try the Buena Vista Private Reserve together for many years, and I adore that in your personality. So besides what... Describe that to us, because all of us look for iconic example as you are. Oh, well, thank you. Um, it's actually, you can, you can disregard it or not, but my wife, Carla, would tell you that it's because I'm an Aquarian. And Aquarians, <laughs> Aquarians think outside the box. And, <laughs> Shouldn't they? <laughs> well, and maybe she pushes you, too. She's a, she's a Taurus. So they're really grounded. They have, you know, they've got, they, they, they don't, they kind of do the same, you know, they're, they're not very experimental. Whereas Aquarians are always kind of, well, let's try this. Let's try that. Let's, you know, <laughs> so that I, I would say that, that plus, plus, as I said, the, you know, um, the, 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 the heritage of Mandavi that I received via Zoma. Um, yep. And, you know, that, the, and then, you know, I mean, Christian, I, I work, you know, I, we interfaced for a lot. I worked for him directly for two years. I mean, he's, he's just nothing but a perfectionist. Yeah, but, you know, within you, there is a constant search for doing something better. And that's what I love is you, you don't hesitate to question and do, which is, I think, very important. And a lot of people are looking for, you know, and I love the expression of, you know, the pictures you paint is the pictures you have in your head. You cannot, as Picasso used to say, you know, as I start a painting with an idea, I finish with another. And it's not always with a finished idea, but how we go towards it. And I think that's what I love. So talking about this, Carla, 20 years together in business. How do oh, you succeed? Yeah, quarter of a century, actually. How does that work? Husband and wife. Pretty it's, amazing. Pretty, it's pretty straightforward. I spend it and she pays for it. So, so <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a division of labor, you know? She has the whip. She, um, she doesn't tell me how to make wine and, and, and I don't tell her, to, her how to uh, do the quick looks and pay the bills, you know? <laughs> She's in charge of all the money. <laughs> but that has been an amazing collaboration and very rare in the wine world. It is, you know, it, it, it is, it's, it's, um, and it, I think increasingly it's, it's that way. It, it often, particularly in, in Napa and Sonoma, it, it takes money to break in on the wine business. And, yeah. and we had no money. We just, you know, the old advice that when you want to start a business, 
don't quit your day job. I was fortunate that worked for me. And then I had, and then I added some, as I, as I went independent, independent, I had some consulting clients. And so we had income to live off of and sort of invest. And we've never taken any money out of the company. It's all gone back into the company. So we grew a little, we, we started with 260 cases and we're, we're about 35,000 cases now. So we're That's in all, amazing. all 50 states and, and 28 foreign countries without partners or without investors. Carl and I own the company completely. And, and Claire and Alan, uh, our son, will, um, will own it um, perhaps sooner rather than later. Um, and, it, you know, so it's how exciting is it actually? And we should pour the next Chardonnay so you could tell us about it, too. We have it here. This is the Buena Vista private reserve that obviously you help us to make. So you're very, with Brian Maloney, you've done an amazing job with this wine. As you describe the wine, tell us how it is to work as a family with your children now, which is, I oh, think, phenomenal. No, it's fantastic. And, and they had to come to that conclusion by themselves. There was never any pressure, but they grew up they grew up, you know, with us talking about the business and, and wine at the dinner table. They started getting sips of wine at the dinner table when they were six years old. And by the time they were teenagers, they, they, could, they were drinking wine with dinner. So, so you I mean, recommend for families to give wine to their kids, right? Absolutely. Good. Absolutely. I mean, you know, the, Jean Charles, they barrel tasted at DRC when Alan was 14 and Claire was 16, you know? <laughs> Love it. <laughs> well, that's uh, the age for sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, well, I, I, I tell you one thing. One, one thing that people forget about these days, there's, there's always a hit come and go um, anti-alcohol, you know, sort of neo-prohibitionist attitude. But wine with meals is the beverage of moderation. Um, right. You know, you just absolutely a cocktail on empty stomach and your blood alcohol goes up like this. But a couple of glasses of wine with, with lunch or dinner and... You know, you're good. Um, so, uh, there was one other question before I get into the wine. Do you want? To well, you know, being with your kids and building a family legacy like this is very exciting. So, how is it to work together as a family now? Oh, they're, oh, it's great. It's yeah. I mean, it's great. They're they're coming along. We're bringing them along slowly. I'm, um, you know, but. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm any I'm, advice you would give, you know, our daughters are nine. They've been drinking wine even before Gina's irresistible chest. You know, I gave them a little bit of JCB Burgundy wines, as you know. So the ladies are fully trained on wine by nine. So what advice do you give to everyone? <laughs> They're going to push nope. us out quickly, which I hope. No pressure. And always talk to your your kids like they're adults. Never talk down to them. Talk to them, just explain stuff in language that they can then understand. And so they've been hearing us talk about wine and, and, yeah. and, they, and, and the business, you know, their whole lives really. And, and so, um, yeah, that's what I would say. Well, um, that's a great advice. Thank you so much for that. A great um, relationship we've had in addition to friendship is, you know, making the wines together at Buena Vista. So for everybody to know, when we acquired Buena Vista in 2011, I had one man in mind, David. We had done many tastings together. I admired immensely his wine style, his palate, how he made wine. So Brian Maloney, who is the director of winemaking in Sonoma, both the Loach and Buena Vista said, if David accepts to consult with us, it would be a dream. So we started together to really revamp the idea and the image and of course the style of the Buena Vista wine. So tell us about this one because it's, it's your, your DNA is right here. Uh, well, a couple of uh, background stories uh, prior. First off for your audience, I think it's important to know, and I know this from my time with Christian and then secondarily with Jean Charles, that the French often have more respect for history in California, in America, than, than Americans do. And it, you can't overstate how much Jean Charles should receive credit for and be respected for, Thank you. 
purchasing Buena Vista and the, and making the tremendous investment to to uh, earthquake proof that stone building. That was a <laughs> tremendous project. And I, honestly, I'm not sure there's an American that, that would have done it. But but with Jean Charles respect for the it, it, what was it? Was it the first? It wasn't the first winery, was it? Was it the first winery in California? Yep. The it first was. winery in California, and it took a Frenchman to, to refurbish it. I mean, that's that's extraordinary. So that's one story. Second story is, so <clears throat> now I'm talking to you, the audience, rather so much as John Cart, John Charles, but Thank you when the, 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 early, the early consulting days, John Charles had the idea that they needed a, a, a Buena Vista winemaker. And so I was involved in, in those interviews and I would I'm going down to Buena Vista or sometimes over to, to Raymond in, in, in St. Helena. And, and we were having a little trouble. I mean, I don't know. We might have gone through about six interviews and we were having a little trouble. And um, one, one day after one of them, I said to Jean Charles, what, what, what about Brian? I mean, Brian, you know, Brian's great. And, and so that I consider that my greatest contribution. Well, it's, just, it's a great one because often we have you know, which is great as we run businesses and many of our guests and friends do the same. You know, the answer is in front of you and you don't always see it. The beauty is Brian was managing the loach and we thought we got to get maybe someone else, but the same person could do both with a great talent and great direction from you. Well, amazing. So, sometimes that's why sometimes a, a consultant just provides an outside perspective that's useful. So now moving on to this wine, I'm going to be, I'm, as, as you may know, I'm always uh, fairly straightforward, and and I'll I'll make an observation in the in the the um, it, this is a richer wine than ours for those of you who have it in front of you, and and it, it could be a little higher alcohol. I'm not sure about that. It has um, it, it has lower acidity and a, and a fuller fuller rounder richer palate. Yeah. Um, our Chardonnay has a, a is a leaner crisper palate. So um, that's the biggest difference. Um, there's, I think, more um, highly toasted oak in the in the Buena Vista wine. There's, right. there's there's more of a smoky nose to mm -hmm. to it, and 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 this is more what, uh, and and this could well be, you know, the goal. But this is more what people think of these days as or expect as a California Chardonnay. I, I hope I'm I'm not speaking out of turn, John. No, that's perfect. Um, exactly. And whereas I, I've been, uh, you know, I mean, the 90s, if the 90s were the peak of, of, of Bob Parker's influence and, and the sort of, you know, high alcohol, low acid, really oaky Chardonnays, I've been, I never was all the way that way, never. But even so, I'm, I'm harvesting earlier and, and I'm using less, less new oak. Um, so, and, and, and the acidity is always a prominent part. I mean, I, I, I think yeah. I'm a classicist in the sense that we don't, we don't aim to make a cocktail Chardonnay. I, I like that. I, I think our Chardonnay drinks well by itself, but really it's, it's meant to go with seafood. It's meant to go with, with, with a meal. Now, I fully agree. So David, well, thank you for that. We got to go soon to the red wine. If you, a question I never ask you, among all our fantastic time together, if you would not have made wine, what would David Ramey would have been? You know, I, I, oddly enough, I've, I've been asked that question before and, and I didn't have much trouble coming up with, um, with an answer. Um, it, ha it would have to have an aesthetic aspect to it. Yeah. And um, so I, I would consider, I if I had to start all the way over from, from college, if I were to be an architect. Yes. And then at the same time, to have a degree in structural engineering, mm. so that you would understand. I remember talking with an architect once who described a, a designer, because you can you can design buildings without having an architectural, you know, even having you know, but you have to have then an architect stamp it, stamp the plans. But this guy told me about this architect that designed this beautiful house, but it wasn't attached to the ground um so that that stuck with me and and that mm -hmm. that sense of what holds the building up and how 
you know, in, in addition to just the design aspects. To me, that would be great. And then to top it off, if, if I were able to, to be a bit of a developer where then I could conceive, design, construct, and then either sell or lease or operate my own buildings. That would be, that would be I, I, I could see that in you and you, you're going to get maybe the opportunity to do that on your beautiful side in, on the West Side. One, one day. Yes. So who, um, you know, one of my favorite questions always is, and I have many inspirational people. One of them for me is a painter, Salvatore Dali, because I really feel I belong to that surrealistic era. For you, who inspires you the most in this, in this world? In the world? In general. Who Not... is, who has, what, where, you know, who has inspired you the most? As I'm serving, The now, fabulous Remy Pino. Well, I think about that, John Charles. I want to turn the table on you. And since I gave you my opinion of the Buena Vista Chardonnay, I'm going to ask you for your opinion of this wine, stylistically in balance. And so, um, oh man. Well, I would say this Pino. So we are everyone tasting the famous Raymond Remy. Pinot Noir. And what I love about this Pinot, I would surprise you, it makes me think a little bit of a phenomenal Gevray Chambertin Burgundy associated with a little pomard. For some of you who are not as Burgundy savvy, it's a little bit of Côte de Nuit, Côte de Bonne. So that's the ultimate dream. This one is fantastic because I think it brings a sense of earthiness with a beautiful aromatic expression that can only be found as well here. So it has kind of the best David of both worlds. It has that burgundy essence with a fabulous aromatic expression of what the sunshine of California would give you and we don't have in the old world. My view. Thank you. You're My humble right. view as your student. Jean Charles, you made my day. Mm. If I can, I'll, I'll give you. Uh, I'll elaborate on that from another perspective. And sometimes what I, so, um, in, in in California, in in Sonoma, we sort of have, you know, sort of two extremes of Pinot Noir style, and at, and at one extreme you have what I sort of call you have the really rich, darkly colored, high alcohol, thick, almost sweet, syrupy. Um, drink it by itself. I'm not going to yep. name names, but sometimes I call I call that Slurpee juice. Sure. Um, and at the other extreme, you have sort of the remnants of the in pursuit in pursuit of balance movement, where I'm going to make a 12.2 percent alcohol Pinot Noir. Thank whether, you. Whether it tastes good or not, essentially an anti Parker uh, statement. And what they forgot, which you would know is that if most Burgundian Pinot producers were faced with a 12.2 alcohol harvest, which is potential alcohol, which is not uncommon in a, yeah. in a, in a, uh, an, an année moyenne, um, they would chaptalize it to 13.7 because it brings a little pleasurable richness to it. So uh, this style that I, I like is, I could say, Burgundy in a ripe year or midway in between that sort of Sonoma Coast hair shirt, uh, Russian River Slurpee juice style. Love the description. <laughs> so in, in, in your life, what drives this incredible passion that you have of quality, of that sense of perfection? What, what is your drive? I'm, I'm, I would answer, I was fortunate enough to have what in French you would call a coup de foudre, a coup de foudre. Uh, an inspiration, a lightning bolt. I was driving in Mexico and, and I had been visiting wineries, reading, reading wine books and, and buying wine. And um, I mean, to me, the, the, the wine epiphany was, I, I had a friend who lived in the Berkeley Hills who worked for the University of California. And um, she would have these soirees really with, 
with professors of etymology and, and uh, from Japan and from Berkeley and photographers from National Geographic and, and wine was the glue that, that had, that, 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 that let people who didn't even know each other yes. enjoy two and three hour dinners together. It was just, I thought this was incredible because I grew up an only child in a household with, where dinners were often the three of us 20 minutes and sometimes with no, right. no conversation. And when I discovered wine, it was like, this is, this is the way to live life. This is, this is the way life should be lived. And so, so I, can, I can honestly say in conjunction with that, that coup de foudre, that inspiration, why not make wine, um, that, it, that, that, that there is a, a, an altruistic basis to it. And, and it was to, to make people's lives better in, yes. in some small way. Um, so that, you know, when, when, when they come home and they have a couple of glasses, of, you know, you and your wife, you, you know, you and your husband, you split a, glass, a bottle of wine with, with dinner. And, and, you know. What about one each? Life is good, pardon me? What about a bottle each? Just Well, a bottle of each. You know, in our household, um, and, and, I, and I would say this to our listeners, don't worry about the old thing of you open a bottle of wine, you have to finish it. That's We've it. got open bottles all over the place. And sometimes it takes one night to get through them. Sometimes it takes two. But we start every meal with a white. And then we move to a red earlier or later, depending on what we're eating. And, and you know, if, if you want one more glass of wine, open it up. If it's a red, younger red, not an old red. If it's a younger red, put the cork in it, leave it on the counter. Come back to it the next day. If it's That's white, right. like our, our Chardonnay. Put the put the cork in the bottle. Put it on the door of the fridge. Come back to it the next day. So, um, yeah. And that's the positive thing, if any, during the last three months. I mean, a lot of people have opened their cellars. A lot oh. of people are enjoying wines. <laughs> right, get together. And you mentioned something so important that I think you display so well with your children, with your wife, with your friends. Take time to enjoy And I think take time to sit at the table, have a great meal. And I've had many great meals with you and we spend hours and we talk and we exchange. That's, and I really that's hope, life. you know, the, the last three months we've lived, David helps us, all of us, to give time, time, to allow time to provide time to our own evolution of what we are within the time line of space. And I think it's key and wine and a wine like you've made really helps us as well to reflect on it. I don't want to be too philosophical. No. Maybe the last wine. Yeah, the last wine. <laughs> Now it's time for the last Cabernet that you help us craft. Because if many people think Mr. David Ramey is Chardonnay Pinot, Russian River only he is Cabernet. And he is red blend. And he knows how to make them all. So, David, just three words to describe this wine. Yes. Buena Vista Private Reserve. Yeah, there's only 200 cases. So you need to get this one from the winery, I think. Mm -hmm. um, dense, full, yet smooth. So it's 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 really deeply colored it's 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 obviously dense wine it's full bodied but it's smooth it's not aggressively tannic that's how i would describe that thank you thank you so much i love it so david any dreams we have a few minutes left people are going to go to dinner they're going to open as you said many bottles of wine now any dreams you have not yet fulfilled that you want to share you well? Oh, there's a huge one. As you mentioned, we did buy Westside Farms on Westside Road. It's a 75-acre yep. parcel with uh, 42 acres of grapes. Uh, it's a mile south of Rocchioli, and we, we make a Rocchioli Chardonnay. It's across the street from William yep. Stallion. And there's an old uh, hop kiln, 70 years old. It's falling down. There's an old Bailen barn where the dried hops were baled to then send to the brewers. And um, uh, it took us six years, but we got a permit to build a winery. Congratulations. There. So you you're know, going to get to be the architect and the engineer now. Uh, 
Well, I, I, I chose an architect, Dolly Lundberg, out of San Francisco that I had worked with at Rudd, at the Rudd uh, Caves. Yeah. And um, so, so the goal, so it took six years. People might not know how difficult it can be to get a permit to build a winery in Napa and Sonoma these days. It, <laughs> John Charles knows it's not easy. That's why John Charles, congratulations, the smart <laughs> entrepreneurs buy existing wineries with existing permits. I had to tackle it from ground zero and pay the price on along the way. So anyway, of course, then we had the fires in 2017. We had the, we had the fires uh, last year and, and the price of construction has gone up. And, and, and so my goal, my hope is to finish, you know, is to build that winery, but we've got to save up a few more nickels first. So. Well, which is uh, so exciting though. It's full circle with, what inspires you and you're going to have to be, and you're going to get to be the architects. You're going to get to be the engineer. I'm sure you've already designed it and I cannot wait to see your drawings. Now, maybe the last question tonight, David, and, and I know we're holding you from your dinner, but a secret you've never shared. Something that even Carla maybe doesn't know the beautiful Carla that I wish we saw with us tonight because she's amazing and you make such an incredible couple. Gina and I, you know, have so much admiration and affection for you. So something wild and crazy. So when we think of David Ramey, we know. Could be about love. It could be about passion. It could be about excess. It could be about being born French, for God's sake. David Ramey. Um. <laughs> I, I, I'll step out a little bit. Um, she knows a, a, a little, not, but um, it, this might go back to to your question of my where my answer was because she would say I was an, an Aquarian. But during my UC Santa Cruz undergraduate days, this was from 1969 to 1973. Um, I did uh, indulge in psychotropics uh, a few times. Be done. Um, and how could um, you do that? I love it when you say just a few times. Well, probably half a dozen LSD, mescaline, uh, psilocybin, and not everybody. I mean, I don't know. What do I have to lose? I'm almost seventy years old. I mean, you know, so it's not. But but that's I, why you look so young. Maybe it helped. I, I can say that that it. It, it takes you outside of your worldview um, and that some of that stays with you and you, you, you kind of maybe think of existence in a little, a little different way. And so, um, you know, recently the, the, the professor at uh, Berkeley um, who wrote the book on, on food. Michael Pollan. Michael Pollan, he wrote a book. I knew uh, you would bring him up because uh, what a, a, a book about, you know, so I, I think that probably gave me permission because, you know, it's not such a dark secret anymore. It's in the, it's in the public uh, domain. Um, but that's, that's something that not all of uh, your listeners might, who, who otherwise knew me might have known about me. I, I certainly did it, but I figured <laughs> because the way you go on a tangent to the circle, the way you are, and the way you've lived your life and the way you've built all what you've done is such a great example, not only for me, because I've had, dear friends, the pleasure to be with David so many times around the round table, taste wine, to all of you who are looking for inspiration and a great leader and a great transformer of a very traditional world. This is the man you just heard for 45 minutes. So David, can I thank you again for being with all of us. Raise my glass to the beautiful Carla, who in spite of over 20 years of business, you said 24 together, is still loving you to this passion. <laughs> and to your children, because you started something amazing, to the family legacy you're building and to this great, you know, momentum, rhythm of life you have. So, Thank you so much for being with us. John Charles, thank you. Let's visit again very soon. And thank you for your wise wisdom, for your incredible, you know, discussion and the great time we had together. So to very soon again.
I look forward to it. Cheers, David. Thank you. Stop my video. I'm out. It's just him. That was great.